morning we're going to be taking a break from the Gospel of John to consider a text on the uh, resurrection. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15 and I would like to make a change on the fly if I could. I, I realize that I'm including a, a large portion of, my, of the text that I was going to read in the sermon. So if you could fast forward to verse 12, that would um, make things easy because this is really what we're going to be looking at. Verses 12 through 22 of 1 Corinthians 15. And I'll read that, and I'm going to make reference to the first 11 verses uh, in the sermon. Uh, so let's begin in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made Alive. Let me just um, stop reading there and point out that, that Paul is not saying that, yes, Adam condemned all of us, but Jesus is going to make everyone that Adam condemned alive. But what he's saying is that, yes, in Adam we all died and everyone was an Adam. And we all come into this world dead. But those who trust in Christ, those who are in Christ, those who are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, they are the ones who will be made alive because of the resurrection. May the Lord bless his word to us this morning. Now again, this morning, we're going to look at something which I think all of us have been thinking about as we came to church today. And the reason why we did that, of course, is because it's Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday has that, um, that effect on us, doesn't it? To draw our attention to this one event, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that, that after he was crucified, that after he died, that after he was buried and in the tomb for three days, he rose again from the dead. Now, we do want to ask the question, just how important is the resurrection? Well, I think the fact that it shows up on the church calendar shows that the Christian church, at least historically, has placed uh, some value on this event, at least uh, you know, enough to warrant this, this day, so that the faithful will not forget but I do want to remind you that God places even more value on that day than the, the Christian church sadly seems to have done because the Lord doesn't want us to celebrate it just once a year, but he wants us to celebrate it every week. And why is that? Because the resurrection is really the culmination of Jesus' work. It signals the completion of what Jesus Christ did, which is to bring in the new creation, to make all things new again. And, of course, of our being made new creatures in him, because in Christ we are part of the new creation. As you know from Scripture, our Lord originally created everything in six days, and he rested on the seventh day. And then he set that day apart to be a day of rest and worship for his people because he's worthy and because we need it. And we know that this Sabbath day, this day of rest and worship, continued even after Adam and Eve sinned, even after they destroyed the creation with their sin. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve sinned, all creation came under the corruption of sin. And we know that because it's, it's groaning even now, longing to be set free from it. But they didn't curse just the creation. 
they also cursed all of their children. And that's the reason why we come into this world already bound for hell. But when the Son of God, that is when Jesus came into this world as a man, and when he died and rose again to life, he completed that new creation. He laid the foundation for it in which everything is going to be made new again. The Bible tells us that the present heavens and the present earth are one day going to be destroyed, or at least that's what it seems like it's saying, it's going to be destroyed, but it's actually going to be purified, purified from the corruption, from the sin. And a new heavens and a new earth is going to be born out of it because of the work of Christ. And in the meantime, Scripture tells us that everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, everyone who receives Him, becomes a part of that new creation already in Him. All who trust in Him are made new creatures because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now, by the way, that's the reason why the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that is that day of rest and worship we're talking about, is no longer observed on the seventh day of the week, which commemorated the work of the old creation, because the old creation was destroyed. But now it's commemorated on the first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the day that is called by his own name, the Lord's Day, so that we would remember what he did, what it is we have to look forward to, and how it's really only through faith in him that we're ever going to become a part of that new creation. And by the way, let me remind you, you must become a part of the new creation in Christ now before the new creation comes, otherwise you're going to miss out on it. You have to trust Jesus Christ and turn from your sins while you're living and before Jesus Christ comes again. If you're going to be a part of the new heavens and the new earth that he has lived, died, and was raised again from life to bring in. But now what I want us to focus on this morning is the resurrection, of course, because it is the key. Without the resurrection, there would be no new creation. Without the resurrection, there would be no possibility of salvation, which is, of course, being coming a new creature in Christ. There would be no hope of anything there would only be the prospect of judgment. That's what Paul tells us this morning. So what I'd like us to do is look at three things. First of all, that there were some at Corinth who denied the possibility of a resurrection. Secondly, what that would mean if there were no resurrection. And thirdly, what it means that the resurrection actually did take place. So first of all, let's consider there were some in Corinth who denied the possibility of a resurrection, and we see that in verse 12. Paul writes, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, let's not miss the positive part of what Paul is saying right here. He is pointing out, first of all, that there were those who did believe in the resurrection, and we're preaching it, something that the Lord actually wants us to be doing to one degree or another. Now, now, who were these people that were preaching Christ? They were those who actually saw him, who saw him alive after the crucifixion, ones that he had called to be witnesses of this event because of the fact that they had seen him, such as the 11 apostles. We read uh, in Luke Chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were telling these things, and he's referring to the two who were on the road to Emmaus who saw Jesus Christ, you know, after he had been raised, he himself stood in their midst. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they could still not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written 
that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Notice Jesus showed himself to his disciples so that they could go and tell others what they had seen so that others might believe. Now Paul tells us that Jesus showed himself to, to many more than this, to over 500 at one time, and then finally he showed himself to Paul. In the opening verses, I told you we were going to get back to these in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. That's what Paul tells us. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God with me. Whether, in, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. Now again, why is uh, Paul drawing their attention to this? It's because there were some among you who deny the resurrection of Christ, but yet we're preaching it. Why are we preaching it? Because he says we have seen Jesus. Now we don't know how many saw Jesus Christ altogether, but we do know from Scripture that all it takes to establish the truth of any one event is two or three witnesses. Jesus appeared to over 500 at one time. It wasn't just the figment of one man's imagination. It wasn't just the hope that the disciples had that was so strong they wanted to see him, that they actually did see him. It wasn't you know, some sort of mass hallucination. Jesus appeared to these people. He showed himself alive. As a matter of fact, Jesus even had four of them write down their own eyewitness testimonies. We have that in the Gospel of Matthew. We have it in the book we're going through, uh, typically the Gospel of John. Paul tells us in, in several of his letters, but we've just seen here that he saw the risen Lord. That was one of the qualifications for being an apostle. They had to see so that they could bear witness to what they've seen. And Peter also gives us his testimony in his letters. And then, of course, we have the testimonies that were written down of eyewitness testimonies by two other men. In the Gospel of Mark, he gives us the eyewitness testimony of Peter. And Luke, of course, is the one who went out and surveyed all the witnesses. He examined everything carefully, took it down, and then wrote this Gospel. But yet, in spite of all these witnesses, there were those in Corinth who still denied the resurrection that even such a thing was possible. Again, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection from the dead? Well, what is it that they were sticking at? Why the problem, believing? When Paul, you know, preached, as I mentioned before, the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Mars Hill, the philosophers had the same reaction. They didn't believe him either. In Acts 17, verse 32, Luke writes this. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. You know, sometimes, actually many times today in the church, there are those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they too have difficulty believing that Jesus rose again from the dead. And why do they have difficulty? Well, because it's something that doesn't happen every day, right? We don't see people popping up from the dead. People die and they stay dead. This is a miracle. 
This is something you need faith to be able to believe. You need to believe what God says. You need to believe the testimony of those who, see, who saw what was going on. Uh, we need really the testimony of the Holy Spirit in order to believe this. Now, we haven't seen the resurrection from the dead, but there were those who did, who saw Jesus alive after he had been crucified and in the tomb for three days. And you know as well as I do, you need to believe that testimony if you are to be saved from your sins. Now, Paul goes on to consider for a moment what would be the case if there were no resurrection. Let's say that what these individuals are saying is true. There is no resurrection. Resurrection is impossible. Once you die, you are dead. Well, then what would be the result? Well, Paul tells us in verses 13 through 15. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Now again, just unpacking this, Paul is saying, if the resurrection isn't possible, then Jesus was not raised from the dead because that would be a resurrection. If Jesus wasn't raised, then he says that our preaching, our witness is vain. And what he means by that is it's worthless because we're wrong or perhaps we're deceived or perhaps we're liars. If you happen to believe what we've told you, your faith is also worthless. It's not going to do any good. If we're preaching that God raised Jesus from the dead when God didn't, you know, in fact didn't do that, we're also lying about God. We're false witnesses. Not only are we deceiving you, but we're actually lying about what God actually did. Now again, what are the consequences of that for you individually? If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, well, verses 16 through 19. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Note, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Now again, Paul takes us down that same logical train of thought. If the dead are not raised, then Jesus obviously has not been raised. If Jesus hasn't been raised, then he's still in the tomb. And if he's still in the tomb, your faith is worthless. It's not going to do you any good. Your sins that would condemn you to hell have not been forgiven. And if those sins are not forgiven then those who died believing in Jesus Christ have perished. They have all gone to hell for their sins. It doesn't mean there isn't a hell still. It just means there's no forgiveness. There's no release from hell. And then what that means is that you who have trusted Jesus are also going to go to hell. Now, Paul says if we live with this, this delusion that we're on our way to heaven, when as a matter of fact we're going to go to hell with everyone else, he says, of all men in this world, we are most to be pitied for such a self-deception. Now let me again just explain what, what Paul means by this. What he's saying, of course, is the resurrection is key. If there is no resurrection, then Jesus, then Jesus wasn't raised. But if Jesus wasn't raised, there is no forgiveness of sins. You do need to remember that Jesus died on the cross bearing the sins of his people, bearing your sins of everyone who would actually put their trust in him. Those sins are the reason why Jesus died. Those sins are what put him in the grave. Now the resurrection is the proof. It's the evidence that he actually successfully paid for those sins. His being raised to life means that those sins can no longer hold him in the grave. When God raised him, this was God's public declaration that he accepted the payment that Jesus Christ had made. He accepted that sacrifice as a sacrifice for sin. And what that means is if Jesus hadn't been raised, then two things. First of all, Jesus isn't the Son of God. I mean, the fact that he was raised from the dead was God's 
vindication of Jesus Christ, his justification, so to speak, that everything Jesus said about himself was true. Now we get that from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. This is what Paul writes. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Note, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, his resurrection was God's declaration that Jesus was in fact who he said he was. It was his vindication that what he said was true, his justification. But secondly, I told you, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, it would mean that his payment was not accepted by the Father. The sins that were laid upon him would still be holding him in the grave. And since he was bearing those sins for us, it would mean that our sins also were not forgiven and that we too would perish, that we would be justly held accountable for those sins, for every single sin that we had committed. And we would suffer in hell forever. That's what Paul means when he says those who have died in Christ have perished. It doesn't mean they've gone out of existence. It means that they are now justly suffering the consequences of their own sins. You see, if there is no resurrection, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we are all still accountable for our own sins and we will perish, which is why if we're deluding ourselves into thinking we're going to heaven, we are of all men most to be pitied. But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. There is good news. And the good news is that the resurrection is not only possible, but it's taken place. Jesus was, in fact, raised again to life, which is what Paul goes on to tell us, which is why they were preaching the resurrection. Verses 20 through 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Now I've already told you, we have eyewitness testimony to this fact. Mary was the first to see him. Then he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the eleven, and then he appeared to over 500 at one time. He also appeared to Paul. The Father wanted to make sure that there were those who saw him, who were eyewitnesses of the fact that he was raised again from the dead, because of, as we've seen, this was his declaration that Jesus is his son. This is his declaration that his payment has been received. Since Jesus has been raised from the dead, the sins that he has carried, the sins that he bore, have been paid for. Jesus really is a savior. Trusting in Jesus is not worthless. It is not vain. There is forgiveness of sins in him. And it means also that death isn't the end, but it's just the beginning. Notice Paul says that he is the first fruits of those from the dead. His resurrection is the first. He is the head of his people, but it is the first fruits of, of a following resurrection that is going to take place for his people. And because Jesus lives, everyone who trusts in him, if you are trusting in him, you also will live. You will not only continue to live once you die in heaven, but one day your body will be raised again from the dead and made like unto his glorious body. If there was no resurrection, there would be no hope. But the resurrection has taken place, and so there is hope. Now, in closing, let me just apply this uh, to, to, you know, the two major groups that are present this morning, those of us who have trusted Jesus and those of us who have not trusted. And let me begin with those who haven't. If you haven't trusted Jesus this morning, if you haven't turned from your sins, you do need to realize that your situation is really no different than if Jesus had not been raised from the dead in a certain sense. You have no hope. 
you have no hope that your sins are forgiven. You have no hope that you're going to be delivered from hell. As a matter of fact, you're on your way to hell until you repent, until you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in a certain sense, if you don't trust Jesus, the resurrection is irrelevant. But your situation actually isn't exactly the same. Your situation is worse than if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead. If Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead, we'd all be going to the same place. But from the, because he has been raised from the dead, and because you have heard that he's been raised from the dead, and because God has given to you eyewitness testimony that he's been raised from the dead, and by the way, it's not just the testimony that's written down here. You have several other eyewitnesses to this event as well. We haven't seen it with our physical eyes, but we've seen it through the eyes of faith. Those of us who know Jesus Christ know that we have another witness besides the one that's recorded for us in Scripture. We have the witness of the Holy Spirit who convinces us that these things are true. Well, the fact that he's been raised from the dead and you have witnesses to this, uh, to this effect, that there is forgiveness and eternal life in him, but you've chosen not to accept this, not to believe it, and not to receive him, actually makes you more culpable than you would have been otherwise. You need to remember that God has made this one whom he raised from the dead so many years ago. Uh, he has given him the honor of being judge on that final day. The Bible says he will be your judge. And not only is he going to judge you for every single sin that you have committed in this life, but he's particularly going to hold you responsible for rejecting his gospel, for rejecting him right now because you're not believing in him and you're not receiving him. Jesus said it's going to be worse for those who have actually heard the gospel and turned away than for those who have never heard it. Now in Matthew 10 verses 11 through 15, we see Jesus sending his disciples out to teach and to preach in all the towns and villages in Israel. And of course, there were going to be those who received him, but there were also going to be those who rejected him. Those who received him would receive life and forgiveness. But what about those who didn't? This is what Jesus told his disciples to do. And again, this is the, the Jesus, the same Jesus, who offers himself freely as a savior, who offers grace and mercy for all who will come to him. What about those who reject him? What about those who refuse to come to him? He says this, in whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay in his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you, nor heed your words, whoever does not listen to you, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now those of you who of course are familiar with the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know there was an extreme amount of wickedness going on there. You know that the Lord and, well actually the Lord, two of his angels he sent in there to rescue Lot and his daughters out of that city. And when they came in there, the men of the city wanted to take those angels whom they perceived to be men and they wanted to violate them sexually. They were perverse. God rained down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah for the wickedness of that city. But yet, he tells us, it's going to be worse for those who reject the gospel, who didn't commit those sexual perversions, who didn't try to rape other people. But what they did was, they heard the gospel they had that light given to them, and yet they rejected it. Truly I say to you, Jesus says, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city or that household or that individual that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. So my admonition to you this morning, if you should happen to fall in that category and haven't trusted Jesus, is this. Don't let what is good news turn into bad news for you. Listen to what God says about his son. Listen to the eyewitness testimonies of those who actually saw him, who touched him, who handled him when he rose from the dead. Listen to his spirit, who is bearing witness to the truth of these things and to the reality of your sin and your guilt and 
the truth of the fact that you're going to be judged for those things. Receive his offer. Jesus offers himself freely to you as a savior if you will simply trust him and turn from your sins. He offers to, to forgive you freely and fully every single one of your sins. Let's not forget why Jesus was sent into the world. John writes this in John 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Jesus came as a Savior. He did the work that was necessary to save you from your sins. He offers himself to you as a Savior. You just simply need to receive him. Turn from your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't find it in your heart to do that, you need to pray and ask God to change your heart because it's only sin that's keeping you from coming to him. He is pure love. What he desires for you is purely good and holy. And if you don't turn to him, he will hold you accountable for your sins. Yes, he is love, but he is also justice. And how do we know that? Because the Bible says it, but also because of what he put his son through. He had him nailed to the cross by the hands of sinful men. He laid our, our sins upon him, at least the sins of those who would trust in him, and he had him bear those sins in their place. Why would God do that if he wasn't a God of justice? Justice has to be satisfied. And either Jesus can do that for you, or you can suffer it yourself. But justice must be paid. God is just, but he is also love. He offers you a way out if you will simply trust in his son. Now, as I've said, I'd also like to apply this to those, of, well, to those of us who do know him only by his grace and his mercy. For those of you who do know him, be encouraged this morning that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ means for you that death is not the end, but death is really only the beginning. Jesus was raised for you. And because he was raised, your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus was raised, you also are going to be raised. Uh, for you, as, as you've maybe noted several times through these scripture readings, death is only f to fall asleep, to immediately awaken again in the presence of the Lord, in the fullness of his love, the fullness of his joy, never to die again, never to suffer anything again, but only to enjoy the blessings of heaven until the Lord returns to raise your body from the grave, transform it into his own glorious image, and then unite you with it forever to enjoy the blessings of the new heavens and the new earth, that new creation which we saw at the beginning, Jesus came to bring in. The resurrection means that everything that Jesus said, everything that he promised you is true. He has done it. You have a glorious future. And so as those who have received these blessings uh, through faith in his name, do your best by his grace to honor the Lord with your life, to become the kind of person that Jesus wants you to become, to become like him, and, and to do what it is that, that he calls you to do in this world, which is to help others find their way to him. Remember what we read in Acts chapter 4. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, what we have read, the resurrection, this is the only way of salvation. This is the only way that anyone in this world is going to escape a very real hell. And really, the only people that can tell them are the people who know who know him, who know the gospel. Jesus wants us to share this message with others so that they too might be saved. And the Father wants us to do it so that we might gather together Christ's sheep into one fold to give honor and glory to him, even as we gather together to worship him on this day and as we also seek to glorify him in our lives. That's what the Lord wants us to do is gather more people through the gospel to do this very thing. 
for his honor and glory. So by the grace of God, as we think about the resurrection, let's remember too that when Jesus died, we died with him. When he was raised again to life, we, we rose with him in order to live a new kind of life. Now that's actually what we're going to be looking at this evening. The power of the resurrection in our lives. The resurrection is that by which God raises us to life. If we trust in Jesus, he will raise us, well, he actually raises us spiritually through the resurrection to trust in him. There is a resurrection to a new life, but the resurrection also gives us power. Power to live the kind of life that the Lord calls us to live. So I would encourage you to return this evening again to honor the Lord for what he has done and because he is worthy but also to be encouraged to seek after the power that he makes available to us to live the kind of life the resurrection calls us to live. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask for the Lord's help to do this.